Hey, so good morning again. Uh, we will see today our phenotyping center, what we call functional phenotyping, which means we don't use or almost do not use cameras. We mainly use uh, um, probes and sensor to sense the whole plant water relations. So I will give you some ideas of, of about what you're going to see. We're going to see it, and if you have questions, then we have long drive back, so we can talk about it. So phenotyping today is a major issue. It's, it's growing all the time. And the main phenotyping that most of the people know are the imaging and metabolites. So you just take some kind of pictures of your plant in a hopefully high throughput manner. Uh, when we build our center, we decided to focus on a physiological phenotyping, which is a relative new uh, option, and also on performance analysis. Gathering a lot of data today is easy. The problem is how to get the, the data analyzed. So uh, one of the tools we are using are uh, computer, computerized tools. Uh, I'm not going to demonstrate it. There will be some small demonstration, so if somebody find more, more interest in that, please let me know and I will um, uh, give him a short brief later. So why do we need functional phenotyping? Because it doesn't matter what you're going to do and it doesn't matter if I give you the DNA of each one of these horses, you're never going to know who is going to win the, the, the race. Okay? The functional means, okay, we have a lot of data about how they look, about their RNA, DNA, protein, but in order to measure something with interaction with the environment, we must use some system that actually measure the plants um, uh, on the run, okay? So, the same thing happened in our field. We have our field, we can, we can image them, we can see them, but we want also to do some stress test for them, to, to see what happened under stress. And our goal, basically, we are here in the Faculty of Agriculture. I'm a researcher here, and my main goal, I don't like to use all kinds of drought stress, resilience, resistance, and so on. So I would just simply say what we try to do. We try to improve the yield under stress condition. Okay? You can call it as you wish, but this is the real goal, right? To improve the yield in the end. So even under stress, of course, we are not going to get to the control level, but at least get as close as possible. So we all know that there are different plants with different water use efficiencies, but it doesn't matter how we look at it, all the plants have almost linear curve in relation of water and light. So if you look on the right graph, this is yield, the y-axis is yield versus light. As more light you give, of course, assuming you have enough water and nutrient, the more yield you're going to get, the breaking point is really far. Of course, C4 are more efficient so you can get more of them, but it's pretty much linear. And the same thing with water. The more water you give, the more, plant, the more water the plant transpires, the more yield you're going to get. The numbers are huge. I mean, if you, if you check the numbers, to get one maize, one year, you need about 100 liter. And the reason is because the plant water use efficiency is not very good. If we look about the plant, we I consider plant as a bag of water, right? 90% of our crops is water. Take any crop you, you want, take, compare the dry rate to the, to the fresh rate, you get about 90% of water. Now plant, as soon as the sun goes up, start to transpire, right? Open stomata, water going out, CO2 goes in. The ratio between the two in crop, on average, is about 1 to 500. This is water use efficiency, and it's not as good. Now, of course, there are plants with much better water use efficiency, okay, like cactuses. They have something like 1 to 50, but also the yield production is about one-tenth of a crop. So it's a trade-off. You want to produce more, you need more CO2. You want more CO2, you need to lose more water. And during the years, the breeding, the classical breeding processes actually push the wild types or, or the... Or the Land races into high productivity. We all know it. We have a very good cultivar. Elite cultivar today produce a lot. Uh, but the price of productivity, with, with no question, is very low water use efficiency. C 
crops today lose a lot of water, they open stomata much more than the wild type in order to do photosynthesis. And in the process, they lose water, so they have relative low water use efficiency. And the balance today is to find a way to go a bit back here with not too much go back here. Okay? Another problem we have with crops today is the fact that in order to produce that much, they have to take risk which means they have some sluggish response to drought. They are more anisohydric in behavior. They respond slower to, to stress condition. That makes them much more sensitive because when the, the real drought comes, they are already lose uh, a lot of water, okay? So you can say that in our breeding strategy, you have only two ways to go, either productive or survivable, and you must to find your way in the middle. I'm explaining this because our algorithm is built, built on that. You have to define what you want to breed for. And so one, some properties like high stomatal conductance and high transpiration are v going very much for the productive way. High water efficiency usually go very much to the uh, survival traits. And you try to, we are trying to find a way somewhere in the, in the, in the middle. So how can we look for these traits? We use a system called Plant Array, belonging to a company of Plant Detect. The system allows us first to control each and every one of our pots. You will see it in the greenhouse. Each pot has its own controller, its own two valves, so we can control to give to any pot any solution we want in any concentration. So each pot in the greenhouse can get a totally different treatment, while all of them are on the same table, so you really have a, a randomized block, which you can really randomize it because you don't care. The plant going to get the solution you want him to get. The system, I will give more explanation later. We have also an uh, analytical pack so we can get all the data. And in the end, we try to get the data and, and come to, to functional conclusions. So basically, I said today that we are doing performance tests or, st or, a, or a stress test. The idea is like the picture you see on the right. This man is walking on, on some walker. The nurse can control his stress level, like, like the angle and the speed, while on the same time, she takes his physiological measurement, heartbeats, blood pressure, oxygen levels. We are doing the same, only we do it to each plant in the greenhouse. We put each plant under stress, and it's a feedback system. So the system can control each pot based on your requirement. For example, if you want this pot to be on maximum, on field capacity, you will get it. If you want this to be 50%, you will get it, okay? Doesn't matter how much water the plant transpires, the system can compensate and, and, and bring back the water when you want it to do it. You can do it only at night, during the day, or, or so on. So the system uh, is based on three sensors at least per plant. A uh, very special uh, uh, lazy meter, it's a balance, which was well designed first to work in a greenhouse, but also to give very low noise levels because the data we need ha must be very accurate. We work with soil sensors, so each pot has also soil sensors, and VPD stations above the canopy. So we know the soil atmosphere gradient, and we treat each plant as a resistor, so we know how much water we lose uh, both from the whole plant based on the lysimeter and only from the soil based on the soil probes, we can put up to three probes per, per plant. So we can really monitor uh, the soil volume in, in, in few spots. Usually we use the height. Okay? All of these probes measure continuously and simultaneously. We're taking 480 measurements per day per pot. This is in order to get continuous measurement and to be a bit faster than the change in the atmosphere. So if the so we usually work in a non-control condition to be as close as possible to the field condition. But then this, the, the conditions are changing all the time. So we want to monitor a bit faster than the rate of changes. Okay, so this is why we take so many samples a day. So the idea is that each plant can have its own solution in a, in a truly randomized block. So you can really work very nice later with the statistics. What do we measure? Uh, as I tell you, it's with no imaging processes. Everything is with, is with the system I show you. So we have daily biomass gain by gram. The system is very sensitive. We can have even few grams per day. Daily water loss. So it's just how much water the plant loses. And we know also how much uh, 
biomass the plant gain. So we have a, uh, agronomic water use efficiency. How much wet biomass gain per how much water lose. Uh, we have the transpiration rate, which means we just divide the daily water use by the mass and we get normalized to mass, to the biomass, so we have normalized transpiration. We have even stomatal conductance for the whole canopy. We do it by normalizing the transpiration rate to the atmospheric condition, VPD. This is exactly how your gas exchange works. No gas exchange in the world really measures stomatal conductance. It's always been calculated by the flux and the VPD. So we have it for the whole canopy. Uh, we measure root performances, what we call root fluxes, because we work in a pot and we have soil probes, so we actually calculate the rate of water loss from the pot to the plant. Uh, and by using the root performance with the transpiration rate, we even get relative water content and resilience, which I will explain a bit later what, I, what do I mean by resilience, of course, uh, in a minute. Everything I tell you was published in a special technical advanced plant journal paper which we emphasize the fact that if you want to work on a stress, leave the camera aside. Many people use camera, it's very nice to have, I know, we also use them, but in really in order to get to water use efficiency, which is not normalized to pixels or all kind of, you know, go around, and you really want to control the stress level in a high, in a high throughput. If a maize plant loses two liters a day and it's in 15 liter pot, the change in water is on daily basis, so you cannot just uh, fix it once a day. It's too late. You have to do it all the time. So uh, this is what we actually state in this technical paper, which we c there we explain all the method um, that later on the, the plant tech company bought the patent from the university and established the company based on that. So basically this is the output. Each line here is one plant. This is one day. I'm not going to get to detail so much. The slope is the growth rate. Each down, this is just the weight. So this is the water loss per day. This is the VPD and light change above the canopy. This is a typical drought experiment. You see how, this is introgression lines, IL of Danny Zamir. Danny Zamir is a professor here in the faculty. So we just want to see how much variance there is in this library. Huge variance of, of just respond to drought, all of them respond at the same time, but look at the gap. Here we recover them simultaneously, but of course we can recover each one based on its own performance. What we call resilience is comparing the performance of a plant before the stress and immediately after. Of course you expect to have some decline in transpiration because the plant during stress loses roots, loses leaves. And we also always have control, so you can also compare the plant to its control well irrigated plant. So the resilience, what we call resilience, is the rate of recovery. How fast you recover when rain comes. Um, I won't go too much into details. So this is the light curve, this is VPD curves, this is the weight curve, this is just a s one plant. I'm, I don't have time to go into details. This is the transpiration rate, daily stomatal conductance. We are working now on a big project of just improving this peak. This is a very interesting peak. This is the stomatal conductance. Now you can see that it's open while VPD is still relatively low, but the light is almost 50% of the maximum. The water use efficiency of the plant at this point is enormously, it's very good. And it's very rapidly goes down. Usually we measure water use efficiency here. But, but just by increasing this peak, we believe that we can improve the plant water use efficiency and production without damaging too much its water consumption. So this is something you can only see when you work with a very accurate and high throughput system uh, like this. But we want to focus on roots, so I'm going to give you two root traits that we are measuring. I want to explain you what we, we are doing, and of course if you have more questions I would be happy to. So take for example these pots on the bottom. So let's say we have canopy that look the same, but different roots. Now I put sizes, but it doesn't have to be sizes, it could be activity of roots. Now look at this graph here. So when water are on good conditions, you are not going to see any difference in the transpiration or slightly difference. Now as soon as you start the, st the drought, this plant here is going to, to uh, have shortage much faster than this plant. So you're going to get a reduction in transpiration much faster. This point is one of the most important points to my opinion because it's the drought point. 
You know, drought is a very problematic uh, issue. Everybody defines drought differently. We define drought as the point, soil water content point, where water in the soil become a limiting factor for transpiration. So if we want to extract RNA, we always extract it after this point. Now if these two plants grow together, the theta crete of this plant will be on lower soil water content. Remember, it's an average, because the roots can reach to more water than this plant. Okay? So physically, although this plant is under more severe condition, it's still not under stress, because it still can reach the water. So physiologically, you don't see any symptoms, and I think this is what matters. Okay, not the time, not the, not the soil water content, but the soil water content when you really see impact on the plant. And unless you really measure it, you're just guessing. Okay? So, of course, this point is dramatically changed between summer and winter. Look, it's the same plants because the VPD changed, because the light changed. That means that any experiment you do, if it's drought, you have to involve measuring this theta crit point that we get automatically from the system. Okay? So when we talk about, and the same thing for salinity, it's not the EC or millimolar that matter. It's what is the EC that really is the threshold for the plant transpiration or any other physiological activity. Transpiration is just very sensitive. This is why we use it. By the way, if you have any questions, please just stop me. Another root function that we do, please. So we sample here, 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 usually also here, and at the recovery. We just published a tree physiology paper on pines. Usually we just get a mess of RNA, and after we do this, we get a very clear and nice, if you want, I can send you a paper, on pine trees. It was very hard to do before this. So we extract usually RNA before the stress at the theta crit. During the stress, randomly, I mean, you can do 50%, and then you leave it a few days under severe stress and in the recovery. It's just a suggestion. I mean, you can pick your, your, your own point. So another thing that we do, since we have a probe in the soil all the time, we can take the content continuously. Of course, there is a lot of noise. Each one of you that work with probe know this. But this is part of the system algorithm to help us get rid of these noises. And then if you measure continuously the soil water depletion from the pot, theoretically, it should be equal to the one coming from the lysimeter, right? Each plant is sitting on a scale. But it's not identical. Actually, we prove in a plant phase paper that when you graph the plant on roots with lower function, we use uh, aquaporin mutants that we know have lower water conductance. So water conductivity limitation of the root immediately limits the transpiration. So in fact, we realize that today, almost no one check root property that limits transpiration. You graph plants, especially trees, but you have no idea if the root limits the maximum capacity of the plant's needs at noon. Nobody check it. This delta, we have a, we have a paper, equal to 15% yield in tomatoes. So bringing the plants from here to here by changing their root activity can lead to significant amount of more yield under good uh, condition, but also under me uh, medium uh, stress. Okay? So this is the advantage of continuous measurements. It really gives you the slight changes, like I showed previously on the stomatal conductance and on the root fluxes. Actually, it's only two hours per day. You can easily miss it. I mean, if you measure here and here, you see no differences. OK, so of course, by taking both uh, parameters, you, so we have shoot out flux and root out flux, and the delta between the two is relative water content. It was published, so I'm not going to get into it. The tools, it's very, very important to have computer, compu computer tools that help you analyze your data in real time, especially when you want, the season is the most precious uh, time that we have. So what we do, usually we can compress two experiments in one season because while one is running and we can you know, pick the plant, this is uh, one uh, snapshot of, th of the system, we have always a report on our plant's behavior and we can very fast select our plant 
So while one experiment is running, we, we, start, we already see the, the next one. So in three months, we can push two experiments because the average time we use for experiment is about four to six weeks. Okay, we usually go to flowering a bit later and then take it off and, and bring the new one. If we want to go to, to yield, usually we take the plants and put them in other places because the, we want to, to save the time on the system. And of course, all the statistical tools are complex to it. So of course, this is a mess because you have many plants, but you want to work with averages. You want to have t-test, ANOVA test. You want to do piecewise linear. So all these tools are online. You just connect to the cloud and you see your data online. And you can work with hundreds of plants. In the greenhouse, you're going to see, we have 472 active plants and we are growing. <coughs> Many papers come from this system. I will be happy. Uh, the last one was plant cell of Dudu Weiss, also researcher here in the faculty. So to conclude, the, the philosophy of the system, what we do is comparative analysis. So we always compare the plants and we divide the treatment to several stages before the stress, measure the, the behavior before the stress, measure the response to the stress. So this is more anisoidic behavior. Although drought start here, this plant starts to respond only here, while this one is much more sensitive to the drought. It senses the drought faster, so it responds immediately. Up to T3, this plant is much better because if you get rain or water here, it will produce much better. But a very important point to check is also the resilience, because after the drought, usually rain comes. And then the recovery rate could do the difference, okay? Now, it doesn't, this behavior could be highly resistant or sensitive, resilience or sensitive, and vice versa. We usually don't find too much correlation between this behavior and the resilience one. This is why we suggest to do all the steps together, and then you can have some kind of a profile on your plant response uh, to drought or any other stress. Uh, okay, I think that's it. Uh,